One more time. Good morning. Much better. Much better. You're almost awake. Almost awake. Say thank you for uh, joining us here at Parkway on uh, this special Sunday, Communion Sunday. Uh, we're going to do things just a, a tad bit different this morning, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Is that uh, we are going to have self-serve communion kind of thing, so we'll, we'll make the communion trays available to you. And we'll do that during worship time. So as, as you worship this morning and you desire to come and, and partake of communion, just come and serve yourself and take it back to your seat and, uh, and take communion, you and the Lord. And so we're going to do that today. It's a little bit different and special. Uh, the prayer team will still be av available, but they will be off to the side, so they're not blocking the aisles. So when the prayer team comes forward, they will be off on both sides, so we still have prayer available as well. So uh, that's kind of the different part this morning, a different part of our, our normal routine. So uh, let's stand. And I'm going to ask the prayer team to come so you know who they are, and we'll pray for our service this morning. And... Uh, just expect God to be here. Amen? Oh, well, he might be here. Let's expect God to be here. Amen? Well, that's not much better. Third time is a charm. Everybody pay attention. We expect God to be here this morning. Amen. 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 Father, we just thank you for your holy presence with us. And, and Lord God, as we come to partake of communion with you this morning, we ask today, Father God, that uh, miracles would happen. Miracles would happen because you are a miracle God. And that, Father, when, when things seem rough, when things aren't going the way they should, we can turn to you and, God, that you will change circumstances. You will change things. And so, Father God, we ask this morning that you will uh, be a God of miracles today. And, Father, that the needs that we have and bring to you this morning will be more than met, that, Father God, that they will be beyond our expectation because, God, you love us first before we even knew you. You created us and you loved us and you put us together. So, Father, we thank you for your miracle of life. Father, help us to live it to the full, we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. <laughs>
Thy breath. 
we praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Father. Church, I know you're going to be shouting louder at the Super Bowl than this. Give a shout out to the Lord. I don't think we're done with this song. I'm sorry, but God deserves a bigger shout than the Super Bowl. And you can guarantee that the Super Bowl, they're going to be taking the roof if there is one off of that place. God deserves our praise. And it's fun to shout. It's not like, you know, I, it's like, shout out to the Lord. And everyone's like, oh, this is kind of awkward. But when you're at the Super Bowl, it's fun, isn't it? God wants us to have fun. And not only that, when we shout out to the Lord, things break that we cannot see. Things fall off. If you're afraid, they can fall off. If you're anxious, it can fall off. If you're full of fear or or whatever it is that you're facing, you don't have to always, you know, come up with the right prayers and think, okay, God, take away my anxious wits, take away my fear, take away this, take away that. Just give a shout out to the Lord, and he'll do it. He'll do it. He knows what you're facing. He knows what you're going through. He knows everything about you. You don't have to come up with the exact formula to pray for God to answer you. He knows you inside and out. He knows you better than you know yourself. A lot of times when I'm talking to God, I'm like, God, just tell me what to do because I know you know me better than I know myself. He knows you. He created you. He formed you. So we're going to do this song again. <laughs>
when Casey was standing up there raising her hand, I, I got a picture of, I kind of looked at, looked at the room, and there was a few kids up here that was raising their hand. But we're saying, oh, oh no, you'll never let go. I think part of our praise is that we hold our hand up. When our, little, like our kids were little, and we carried them along, and, we, and they held their hand up, and, and Father was holding on to their hand. And they had confidence because they knew their father or their mother was right there with them. But I think for us when we sing, sing praise, that's great. But sometimes we just need to kind of break that mold and lift our hand. Can we do that and sing this chorus again and say, Lord, I'm putting my hand up. I'm putting my hand in your hand, God, and you'll never let go of me. Never, ever. No matter what I do, if I squirm or wiggle or try to run away, you won't let me run across the street when I shouldn't run across the street. You won't let me get in trouble when I shouldn't get in trouble if I keep my hand in your hand. Amen? So as we sing this chorus one more time, I want us to raise our hand and put our hand in God's hands and say, God, you'll never let go of me, no matter what I'm walking through today. No matter what my circumstances are, Jesus is in control. And Jesus has your best interest in mind. He's not going to let you run into the street to be destroyed. He's not going to let the enemy overcome your life. He's not going to let go of you. You may let go of him, but he's never going to let go of you. Amen? So let's raise our hand and sing just the chorus one more time, shall we? Father, we thank you that we can, we can come to a heavenly Father that has our best interest at heart. And that, Father, as we lift our hands in praise and worship to you, that you grab a hold of them and you hold us tight. Father, you will never let go of us, no matter how we squirm or wiggle, no matter what we do to try to run away. Father, you never let go of us. So, Father, for some of us that have run away and come back, I pray God extra grace for them today. Father, for some of us that have never lifted our hands before and put our faith and trust for, to you today, I ask God that you'll, you'll give a special blessing, an understanding that there is a heavenly Father that loves them and, as Casey said, created them in their mother's womb. Know every piece of us. Father, for those today, we pray a, a special blessing for them. And for us that are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, we ask, God, that we would fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So, Father, today you can be the God of comfort, no matter what circumstance we walk through today. So, God, we pray a blessing upon everyone here. And, God, that you will never, ever let us go. That you will hold us closely, even though we try to maybe run away or squirm away or wiggle out of a circumstance. God, you know everything, and we put our faith and trust and hope in you today. In Jesus' holy name, amen, amen. Hug a neighbor's neck and say hi, especially if you haven't met him before.
You guys are like herding cats, you know what I mean? I turn you loose and it's trying to get you back together is a whole nother deal. Hey, junior hires, uh, Seth, are you ready? Seth, are you ready for your uh, group? I see you have, a, you, have the, you have Jackson over there. He's ready. He's ready. So uh, junior hires go with Seth this morning. Elementary kids, come down front. Time for you to go. Come on. This is a test, by the way. No direction. You're supposed to just come down front. We'll see how many of you remember that you're not going that way today. Hi, sweetie. Guys, I'm helping you out here if you pay attention. You forgot. Pastor St. John said he was going to try to Try to see how many remembered that you weren't going to go that way today. You're going to go this way to the fellowship hall for a special breakfast. So if you want to eat, you got to go that way. <laughs> go that way. Go down by Pastor St. John. That end of the place today, see? Okay, parents, you still... Parents, pay attention now. Parents, you still pick them up in, in, back there at the elementary room after service. They're going to have breakfast or brunch or whatever this is um, during service time. So do we get to come over there or what's the deal? Yeah, okay. So if we all leave during your message, Pastor, you know where we're at. We're down there at breakfast. Anyway, so uh, let's pray for these guys and uh, pray for Pastor St. John trying to feed all these guys. Well, Father, we thank you today for our children. We thank you, Father God, that you uh, uh, bless us with these special, very special gifts. And that, Father God, that as parents and grandparents, we will be able to raise them in the way that they should go. And, Father, we just ask that you'll be with them this morning and bless them. Bless the ones that work with them, Pastor St. John and his helpers as well. And God, let this be a great day that they get to experience you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you, Pastor St. John. My Okay, some announcements, and uh, then we'll we'll uh, got a, a new guest for us. For us, new, not new in the field, but uh, today's mission Sunday, and we have uh, one of our our newer missionaries that we've taken on board, uh, Darren Walker. So we'll see, hear from him in a moment. But I want to say a couple of announcements. The Beth Moore thing uh, uh, that's coming up here at the end of April. You need to check. Uh, on the rooms because the rooms are limited so before you go to uh, online to register you need to make sure that there's still rooms available uh, there are not many so uh, make sure you check with the office before you register so you know that you have a room and get signed up on that so it's kind of it's running down I know it's a ways away but facilities are running short uh, men's breakfast next week uh, pastor pastor Jason is uh, going to be there at 7.30 in the fellowship hall, 7.30 till about 9, I think, something like that. Uh, so Saturday, February 9th, gentlemen, in the fellowship hall. We get to have breakfast. Kids are having breakfast today. We got to wait till Saturday. You know how that works. Uh, say if you're newer to Parkway and that brand new or you've been here for a while and, and haven't come to a welcome lunch, we would like for you to do that uh, next Sunday, February 10th. We have a a welcome lunch in, in that same fellowship hall, which is right outside this door, and you turn right clear down to the end, and that's the that's what we call our fellowship hall. Uh, so we would like to welcome you, and you get a chance to, to meet the pastoral staff, and we get a chance to meet you. You know, in a big setting like this, we don't always get everybody, so it's really important for us and for you to have some, some time to find out what's going on at Parkway and meet the staff that's here. Um, so join us. Welcome lunch next Sunday. So we'll buy your lunch. We'll spend some time together. Also, uh, Life After 50 group is having their annual Valentine's banquet. Cost is $10 a piece. Uh, singles and are certainly welcome. And there's not a couples thing necessarily, but couples and singles are both welcome. We have entertainment. 
uh, we, uh, we have a nice dinner, entertainment, just a great evening out. So, gents, if, if you're married, spouses, this is a great time to, to go out. You can't go anywhere for 20 bucks, you know what I mean? Right? You guys don't agree? It costs us $10 to go to breakfast. So, so it's a nice dinner for, for uh, $10 a person. Make sure you sign up so we know we can buy enough food to go around. Annual business meetings are coming up. Those things are in your bulletin, and make sure you look at those things. Um, that they're, One of them is a pre-business meeting that goes over finances. The other one is uh, the annual business meeting where we'll have elections of elders. So uh, make sure you, you uh, uh, take part in that. Whether you're a member or not, you're certainly welcome to come to our meetings, and we encourage you to do so. Church of the Valley, last thing, boy, long list of stuff this morning. Church of the Valley has a concert here. You remember that we've, we're have we a part of the Church of the Valley group where there are several churches gathered together, and this is an event sponsored by them. We're hosting them, and so at this place, uh, Jared Anderson, he's been here before. It's been a while, and uh, yeah, so come and, come and join us, and at 7 o'clock on Wednesday, uh, February 20th, so uh, a couple weeks away yet, but make sure that you join us here. How you doing? You can tell it's daytime. The fog is brighter than it was last night. I mean, am I like the only one that's really getting tired of this? I mean, it's like, oh my goodness gracious. What was it, Friday afternoon when the sun was shining for about 20 minutes? I mean, I'm, I'm just standing outside. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's getting crazy, crazy old. Some of you that have been around here for a while, they'll remember when this used to be the way it was every winter. Remember that? Uh, some of you that have some history here. I remember driving up onto Mount Sexton and pulling off the freeway just to get out of the fog. I, it's just like after weeks, it was like, I can't take it anymore. But if you just got up above it, then you, get, you could see the sunshine again. So it's, I'm starting to feel that again, you know, like, I'm, uh, you know, but anyway. We're back into our series on Ephesians, and... Uh, to, to, today, won't, today won't take as long as last week. Um, and uh, I, 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 I always kind of marvel at the timing of God. What, what we tried to do last week it, it serves as an illustration of what we want to talk about this week uh, out of our passage in Ephesians. So uh, you have some uh, notes in your bullets in there. If you want to follow along, you have some place to, to fill in some blanks and some discussion items that will, will help you talk in your, your care groups this week about uh, what, was, what was being presented today. Uh, there's also a list there of some of the, the passages of Scripture that we're going to be looking at, and uh, there's some page numbers there. They match the Bibles that are in front of you. So if you didn't bring a Bible this morning, grab one of those, and the page numbers are in the bulletin for you, and you can see that. Uh, and if you brought your own Bible, uh, it'll tell you in the index where Ephesians is. So we're in Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 7. This is kind of the whole section. We'll put it in front of us. We're, all, we're only going to look at, at, uh, at really just a couple of phrases today. He says, to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. That's why it says that when Jesus ascended on high, he led captives in his train, gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean other than that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. That's a real short description of the ministry of Jesus on this planet. It was Jesus who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. I want you to notice that at this point, Paul is looking at kind of the dual phase of what it means to serve Christ on the planet, that part of what we do as servants of Christ is that we are gifted by God to be able to build up the body of Christ. That is happening at the same time, kind of the other rail for the train, if you, if you would think of it that way, is that the mission of God is that we are to be sent into the world as He was. He said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. The whole idea of the Great Commission, go into all the world, preach the gospel, uh, make disciples of all men. The fact that He reminds the Corinthians that you are Christ's ambassadors. God is making His appeal to the world through you. So there is this one side of serving Christ that has to do with spirit with getting the good news and its implications and applications out to people, and at the same time, building up the group of people that are doing that work. 
And so Paul at this point is talking about the, the work that would happen in terms of the encouragement and the building up that happens here. He says, so that the body of Christ may be built up. So that there is a work of service by which each one of us is supposed to be helping the group be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful schemes. Instead, we will speak the truth in love. We will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. For from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligaments, grows and builds itself up as each part does its work. So here is this setting, and again here he's, he's talking about this idea of living a life worthy of the calling that we've received, this high and holy calling of God has said, I want you to partner with me on the planet. There's some things we need to do. He says, I need you to, to respond to that calling with humility. I need you to respond to that calling by working together in unity. I need you to recognize that there is going to be diversity. You're not all going to do the same thing, but you are going to work toward the same goal. And that to try to facilitate this process, he says specifically that Jesus has, has gifted us, he's given to us, the group of people that's trying to facilitate his mission on the planet, he's given to us a group of people to help us, and he lists those people as the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers who are, who are preparing us for works of service. Remember we talked about that, the, the words aren't hard to understand. Work means exactly that, expend energy, work up a sweat, get your heart rate going, that work, and then you are working not for the sake of your own physical improvement, not for the sake of your own spiritual improvement, you are working to serve, it's literally the word that we get deacon, that we get slave from, it means to serve other people in their needs. And so he's saying, this is, this is where we're headed, the reason we're doing that, he says there's some positive things. We want to build up the body of Christ, so we want this group to kind of be functional. We want this group to, to have some, some sense of, of strength to it. We want to have unity of faith, which again is not unity of knowledge, but it is that we all have this overriding faith in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes when we talk about faith in Jesus, what we start thinking of is faith in all the stuff he does. Do I believe that he would do that? The question is not the stuff he does. It's do you believe enough in him that regardless of what he does, you stay solid in your faith? And he says, we want you to be built up in unity of faith, knowledge of the Son of God, because there's a lot of dis misinformation out there about Jesus. I mean, my goodness gracious, there are so many weird ideas about who Jesus is or what he does or what he thinks. And he says, no, well, let's, let's at least clarify the basic understanding of that so that we can be mature. Then he turns around and he contrasts that and says, okay, if these people are working in our lives, encouraging and motivating us so that we can work together and accomplish these positive things, what are the negative things that we would like to see drop off? The first thing he says is in direct contrast to the last thing he said, and that's that we want to get rid of the immaturity. He uses the word for an infant, somebody who's too small to speak. He says, we, we need to grow up. He says, we need to, to get past the place where we are no longer internally unstable, where we're just driven by our emotions, driven by our perspectives, driven by the passions in our life. He says, we want to get past that to where we have some in, internal stability, and then the other thing is, he says, we, we, we want to get rid of this inability to resist external pressure and schemes, because there are always schemes, there are always pressures, there are always people that are trying to manipulate things. Saw today, Dr. Phil has a new book out. A whole big section of his book deals with this very issue. How do you deal with people who are manipulative and dysfunctional around you, and their manipulation and dysfunction is forced upon you, how do you respond? It's a whole big section in his book is about that. Way before he got there, the Apostle Paul did. So, just, you know, just saying. So, in, these are the things we want to see accomplished. These are the things we would like to see go away. And he summarizes all of that by coming to this statement that says, instead of all of that stuff, instead of the deceitful schemes, instead of the manipulations, instead of the emotional passions where you're just driven by what you feel on any given moment or in response to any given situation, in, in, in response to that or in opposite of that, instead of that, we want to be able to speak the truth in love 
so that we will in all things grow up into him, Christ, who is the head. So that's the direct contrast. Direct contrast to schemes, trickery, craftiness, deceitfulness, all those kinds of things is truth spoken in love. Now what's at stake here is whether or not we're going to grow up. Speaking the truth in love is significant to the ability to grow up. Now, it's not just growing up in generic sense, but it's growing up in all things, so it's not like you get to be really mature in part of your life and really immature in the rest of it. Jesus is interested in the totality of who you are. He wants you to grow up in all things. But sometimes people have different versions of what it means to grow up, and so Paul is very quick to clarify, I want you to grow up into Christ. So it's not just what your neighbor thinks maturity is, and it's certainly not what Dr. Phil thinks maturity is, and worse yet, it wouldn't be what Oprah thinks is maturity. (laughs) It's what does Jesus think is maturity. So we are to grow up. We are to grow up in all things. You don't get to, to pick and choose. You're supposed to grow up in the totality of your existence, and as you do that, you're supposed to grow up into Christ. And he says what is crucial to that is for this group of people, collectively and individually, to, de- to develop the ability to be able to speak the truth in love. So we want to look at that real quick. Now, without being overly academic, can we just say that truth is truth? Can we, can we do that? I mean, it's, it's, it's getting harder and harder to do that in our culture. I mean, truth is one of those things that seems to be up for discussion. You know, it's like, you know, you jump off the building, you will hit the street. I mean, there is gravity. You can have an opinion about gravity. You can dislike gravity. You can dislike the guy that discovered gravity. You can dislike the person that made gravity. And at the end of the day, regardless of how you feel about gravity, if you jump out of the window, you will land on the street because gravity works. I mean, there, there is a thing about truth. And it's not all relative, and it's not all what feels good to you. Because if you get cancer and you show up at the hospital, you'd really like the stuff in the bag to be something that's going to help you. So you want to make sure they got the right bag, there's research behind it, there is evidential proof that it actually works, because you don't want to go through chemo with the wrong kind of chemo for the cancer that you have. There is such a thing as truth. There are things that really are true. And there are things that really do work in certain ways. And they work that way for everybody, regardless of how you feel about it. And yet we live in a culture that's really big on, well, you know, that might be truth for you. You know, if that works for you, that's a good thing. <laughs> you know, when, 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 when you go in for surgery, you don't really want to go in with a surgeon that's saying, well, you know, I'm just going to kind of operate wherever I feel, feel best, kind of led today. You know, I, I'm just trying to really be true to myself, you know, I... I, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to be a hypocrite here. I, I, you know, when, I, when I'm there and they're operating, I, I really want to feel it. And if I'm not feeling it, you know, I, you know, I, I, I think I want to operate on this side over here because, uh, you know, I'm just really feeling I need to be on the left side. You know, going, dude, I don't care how you feel. <laughs> you know, I, I don't care whether your kids are got it together. I don't care whether your wife just left. I don't care about any of that stuff. I'm in here for this specific surgery. I want you to do that operation and that procedure on me the right way. There there is such a thing as truth, and we can't just put everything into relative. So when Paul tells us, if we're going to grow up in all things into Christ, one of the things that has to happen is we have to have the ability to speak the truth in love. Not a version of it, not truth packaged to make an impression, not truth designed to cover up a previous lie. We have to be able to speak the truth. Now, he's going to give us the other side of this. And it's interesting, he says speak the truth in love as if it's a single activity. And yet for most of us, we end up picking whether or not we are saying things that we think are loving or we're saying things that we think are truthful. And kind of by how we're wired, we're going to tend to be on one side or the other. Now, maybe that's more evident to me because I'm married to somebody who's on the other side. So if speaking the truth in love is what Jesus called us to do, what do you think Jeanette is most highly motivated to do? Yeah, the love side. Yeah, one of her favorite verses is mercy triumphs over judgment. Which side do you think I'm on? 
And one of my favorite verses is, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. <laughs> so I, it, it seems like such a simple thing to say, just speak the truth in love. The problem is, depending on how you're wired, depending on the passion and the emotion with which you approach the issue, you're going to want to speak the truth or you're going to want to kind of repackage the truth to be loving. And it is very hard to find a place where you are actually standing in the middle and saying the truth in love. So we need to understand first that, that love is not a modifier of the content. It is the definer of the attitude and the approach. It's huge. Love is not the modifier of the content. So you cannot say, because of love, we're going to lie. And yet, that's what some of us want to do. If we don't actually tell a lie, we simply lie by not telling all of the truth. Let's just leave out all the uncomfortable facts. Let's just leave out all the difficult parts. So everything we said was true. We only said half of what was true, but everything we did say was true. Love, love cannot modify the content. The facts are the facts. The facts are the facts. But love is the definer of the attitude and the approach. Because see, some of us are tending to be on the side that says, you just need to know the truth because the truth will set you free. And I'm sorry it's uncomfortable and you don't like it, but I'm just going to hit you in the head with it and then you'll be better. <laughs> and then some of us are on the other side of saying, boy, you really don't want to hear this and you're not going to be real open to it, so let's say something you'd like to hear or let's just not say anything at all. This, this, this speaking the truth in love thing is way tougher than it sounds. It's almost a throwaway phrase in the middle of what Paul's talking about. He said, oh, we need unity of faith. We need to grow in Christ. We need to mature in these ways. We need to no longer be infants and toss back and forth. Just speak the truth in love. It's the hardest thing he says in the whole passage. Speak the truth in love. Too many people turn speaking the truth in love into love means I don't tell the truth. I say more favorable version of the truth so that we can avoid the hard facts. I got to tell you, there's a whole boatload of reasons why not telling the truth is, gonna, is, is wrong. It starts with the fact that you're not telling the truth. <laughs> so the first problem with not telling the truth is you're not telling the truth. So, I mean, that's, wouldn't that kind of be obvious? Okay, all right. Another problem is that it keeps people from facing the real issues in their lives. Because nobody ever tells them, stop that. It's obnoxious, and we all hate it. Quit it. And they run around wondering, how come I have so much trouble with relationships, and how come people avoid me, and I try to get close to people, and then it just never works. And you know, Somebody needs to step up and tell that person why. <laughs> There's a reason none of us like you. <laughs> <laughs> it's because how you behave and how you treat everybody. Stop that. It'd clear a lot of things up, you know? I have to be careful. Remember that you know the truth. The truth will set you free. So you know that's kind of my side of this thing. So I have to be careful with that. But by not telling the truth, it, it does. It keeps people from facing the real issues in their life. It lets them continue in their failure. And I want you to stop and think about that. Is it truly love to let somebody continue in their failure? I mean, at what point do you say, you know what, there's an easier way to do this, and you're killing yourself? I know it. I mean, you're trying hard. I know you're trying hard. And I know you're really sincere, and I know you want it to work out. And I'm telling you, you're doing it the wrong way. Let me help you. If you do it this way, if you do it this way, it'll work. I mean, is it really love to let people continue in their failure? It allows wrong behavior to continue, and in the process, we create a never-ending line of victims to bad behavior. How many people does one person get to hurt before somebody says, stop it?
I mean, I know confrontation is difficult and we don't want to say it, we don't want to bring it up, but how many victims can we create before we say something? Please stop that. Please stop that. But I'll tell you, one of the things that I think it does to the church is that it causes those who watch the church to perceive that we are not a safe place. Because we are a place where the insiders are given a pass on sin and victims are the acceptable price to pay for letting those insiders continue to sin. Do I need to duck? (laughs) Duck and cover! (laughs) What was that Spanish word? (laughs) But honestly, one of the things we want to tell people is that this is a safe place to come. That I don't know how you got beat up at home this week. I don't know how you got beat up at the job. I don't know how you got beat up somewhere else in the community this week. We want you to come to a place that's safe. But if we are unwilling to confront ourselves over our bad behavior, that person walks in, watches the bad behavior, watches the victims, and goes, why would I go there? I've gotten beat up enough this week. Because I don't need to be gossiped about at church like I was gossiped about at the office this week. See, if we don't... If we don't start to speak the truth, if we don't start to confront some of those things that have to do with our failures in our relationships, in our interactions, if we don't stop that, the world looks at us and goes, that's not a safe place. Now, it may not be as dangerous as their family of origin or the place that they work, but it's not safe. It's just less dangerous. Paul says, if we're going to do this grow up thing, if we're really going to do this grow up thing, then we have to be able to speak the truth. Not with the content modified by love, but with the attitude and approach modified by love. But we have to be able to speak the truth. See, being mature, being firmly grounded internally with the strength that allows you to resist external manipulations and deceptions requires the ability to be able to speak the truth in love. Watch the way Paul does this when he talks to Titus about the church in Crete. So it's in Titus chapter 1, verses 12, 13, and 14. So Paul is he started the letter and he said, Hi, this is Paul sending a letter to my dear friend Titus. Remember, I left you in Crete so that you could finish the work that we had started there and you need to do some certain things. So he's in the middle of telling Titus what it is he needs to do while he's there. So it's kind of a job assignment from the boss. So now, talking about the culture that he's a part of on on the island of Crete, Paul says even one of their own prophets, a guy from Crete, probably rather than prophets, we might say poets. That that might be a better word. You know, like the the editor of the local paper. Somebody like that. Somebody that is on Crete commenting about the culture that he lives in. So even one of their own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. Paul says, that's true. (laughs) That's true. Therefore, you need to rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the commands of those who reject the truth. When we see somebody do what Paul just did, what is our cultural defense to what was just said? What's our cultural reaction to that? Yeah, being judgmental. He's prejudiced. He's prejudiced. That's our immediate response. Now, I want you to notice how Paul set it up. Paul said, I didn't say this. Somebody from there who comments on the culture he lives in said they're like this. By the way, I've been there. He's right. It's just the truth. It's just the truth. He said that, that tends to be, I mean, <laughs> that, that's why when somebody behaves badly, we call them a Cretan. Where did that come from? It comes from right here. <laughs> 
There's a reason we use that word. <laughs> I mean, you know, some of you have never heard that word before, but, you know, some of you who've had a few more winters under your belt have, you know, you've heard that word. See, we, we've redefined prejudice from meaning an, an uninformed opinion to now include any informed observation about our bad behavior. Let me, let, me, let me read you this definition of the word prejudice. This comes from the, the American Dictionary of the English Language by Webster, 1828. Here's the definition of the word prejudice. An opinion or decision of mine formed without due examination of the facts or arguments which are necessary to adjust an impartial determination without due examination of the facts and arguments. If somebody actually looks at the facts and the arguments and you messed up, it's not prejudice to say, you messed up. It's not judgmental to say, you messed up. Now, it might be judgmental to say, you are a mess, and none of us like you. That could be judgmental. But to simply acknowledge that when you look at the facts, that was a mistake is part of the ability to speak the truth. And yet we have built into our culture an immediate defense that any time we get caught, that person's being judgmental and prejudiced. They never have liked me. Whether they like you or not does not change the fact that you just messed up. And if you keep doing that, you're going to hurt yourself and you're going to hurt the rest of us. Stop it. But we just have this defense. It's just part of our culture. So not only do we have this defense that says, I don't want to hear it, it becomes one of the greatest social food paws of our, of our society to ever bring it up to anybody else. It's unacceptable to say it, and we have built up a wall that says, I don't have to hear it. And Paul said, if you can't figure out how to speak the truth in love, you're never going to grow up. You're going to stay locked in your failures. You're going to stay locked in your immaturity. You're going to stay locked in to those destructive behaviors, both relationally and personally, until somewhere along the line we learn how to speak the truth in love so that we can stop the cycles of failure and confront the real issues. We, we've changed the meaning of the word prejudice to mean it's any time anybody criticizes anything that we've ever done. See, speaking the truth in love does not mean we can only say things that people want to hear. But it does govern how we say all things. We have to say it in love. But it does not mean that everyone has to love what we say. See the difference? You have to say it in love. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to love what you say. And we've turned the verse around to say, speaking the truth in love means whatever I say, everybody loves to hear. No. <laughs> you can say it with love and the other person say, I don't want to hear that. Well, sorry. Because you need to know the truth because the truth will set you free. So I'm not yelling at you. I'm not trying to win the argument. I'm not telling you you're a bad person. I'm simply trying to help you acknowledge reality. That is bad behavior. And if you keep doing that, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt yourself relationally. You're going to hurt yourself physically. You're going to hurt yourself financially. You're going to hurt yourself somehow. So it doesn't mean that they love to hear it. But you have to say it in love. Now, in this case... It's not saying it in the love of telling the truth. Because here's where some of us fail. And if you, if you kind of notice, we, we're just, we keep bouncing back and forth between the guardrails of love and truth. Some of us just love to tell the truth because we love to win. We love to be the one that wins the argument. We love to be the one that fixes the problem. We love to be the one that confronts the bad behavior. We like to be the person on top. We love the truth. 
When it says speak the truth in love, it's not talking about loving the truth. It's talking about loving the person you're talking to. Or harder yet, loving the person you're talking about. The reason I know this one is so hard is because I'm so familiar with it. Because I start with truth and move back toward love. And sometimes I get sidetracked along the way and say, by golly, what we need here is a little more truth. What this person needs to know is exactly what they need to know, and I'm the person that's designated by God to let them know it. (laughs) I can straighten this situation out. I have a verse to back myself up, because if they know the truth, the truth will set them free. Look at their bad behavior, and look at how their bad behavior is having a ripple effect and hurting all these other people around them. I need to stop that in Jesus' name. So you can get real self-justified, you can get real self-righteous, you can get all wound up, and in the end, what you're loving is the truth, but you are not loving the person you are talking to, you are not loving the person you are talking about. You got to find a way to do that. You got to find a way to do that. It's not the love of the truth, it's not the love of saying hard things, it's the love for people. Paul's, Paul's going to go on and explain that a little bit later. It, it's actually in the next part of this same chapter where he starts giving us very specific instructions about righteous living. So in Ephesians 4.29, he says, Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. The word for unwholesome is the, is the word for rubbish or garbage or trash. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. At this point, he's not talking about profanity or swearing. He talks about that in other places. Look what he contrasts unwholesome talk or or trash or rubbish talk. He says, but only what is helpful for the building others up according to their need that may benefit those who listen. We tend to want to say what benefits us, the speaker, that makes our point, that wins the argument, that proves that we know what we're talking about. And here he's saying, what I need you to do is to say things that are beneficial to the person who's listening to what you're saying. Help them. Which means sometimes you got to slow down and work a little bit harder to get around to the point that you're trying to make because you're trying to bring that person with you. Or sometimes it allows you to be very direct It's not a style of speech. It's does it benefit the one who hears you? I have a friend in town. He and I for a while had the same doctor. He told me this story about our doctor. He said, uh, I showed up. He says, I can't even remember why I was there, but I was there for something. And at the time, I was a smoker, he said. So I had my cigarettes in my pocket. I'm there at the doctor's office. We're talking about whatever my problem was. He said, and then the doctor reached over, grabbed those cigarettes out of my pocket, ripped them up, and threw them in the trash can and said, stop smoking those, they're going to kill you. He said, I walked out of there and never smoked again. (laughs) Speak in a way that benefits the person to whom you're speaking. So I need you to understand that speaking the truth in love is not a style of speech. It's not always soft. It's not always indirect. It doesn't always kind of hint at what the idea is so that they don't get upset when you just say it. You, it. It's not a style of speech. It is knowing and loving the person well enough that you know whether you can grab it out of their pocket and rip it up and say, stop that, it's killing you. And you go, oh, okay. Why? Because that's the kind of guy this guy is. That's how he deals with life. That's how he makes decisions. That's how he processes life. To sit down and give him a 20-minute speech on the dangers of smoking would have done no good. But when a guy he respected looked him in the eye and said, knock it off, you idiot, he went, oh, yeah, you're right. So I want you to hear that speaking the truth in love is saying what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. So I don't want you to get hung up on a style. I want you to get hung up on a motivation. The motivation is love. 
And sometimes love means, hey, this person's pretty straightforward, pretty direct. What they need to hear from me is something pretty straightforward and pretty direct. That's how they think. It's how they process. It's how they make decisions. For other people, you need to say, you know what? They don't do anything that quick, and they don't do anything that direct. We're going to have to take a little more time and work our way around to get to where we need to go. But in the end, love is not going to change the content. It's going to change the attitude and the approach that I use. Here's another great example of how Paul does this to a guy by the name of Philemon. You ever read Philemon? Yeah, it's a little tiny short letter. The grace of God is doing to Philemon what the grace of God does to all of us. It is messing with his assumptions and his prejudices. Because the grace of God will always mess with your assumptions and your prejudices. Always. Philemon is a wealthy man. A wealthy man in first century Rome is a guy who has a household, most of which is made up of slaves. Not slaves in the kind of cotton field farmer working American slave image that we have, but some of them are probably as well or more educated than he is. They are the people who run his household. But there are cultural legal restrictions around their freedom. It's a different system than what you and I know. But Philemon is raised in this system. He has certain assumptions about himself. He has certain assumptions about his roles and responsibilities. He has certain assumptions and prejudices about the people that are working for him. And there are laws that validate his assumptions and his prejudices. One of those is that if you are working for this person and you are a slave, you cannot just take off. The penalty for taking off is death. Philemon is this very wealthy man. He has this whole house, he has this whole household and entourage, and the church in his community meets in his home. He is a new Christian. One of his slaves runs away. He doesn't just run away, he has to get enough money to get out of town, so he steals the money from Philemon so that he can get to Rome. Because in that time, what you did as a slave was you escaped to Rome and you just buried yourself in the metropolis of millions of people and nobody could ever find you again. It was how you, how you became free. So he steals the money from Philemon and he heads to Rome. Now, in the providence of God, how this happens, I have no idea. But this man that runs away by the name of Onesimus ends up in contact with the Apostle Paul who had led Philemon to the Lord. And Onesimus finds Paul who is in prison for the gospel in Rome and Paul leads Onesimus to the Lord. So now we have two Christian brothers, one of whom is the owner of the other according to the laws of Rome, one of whom is a thief and a runaway which bears with it the death penalty And Paul sends a letter to Philemon in the hands of Onesimus, the guy that ran away. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, the truth, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Whoa, that's just a little bit manipulative, you think? Oh, yeah. I appeal to you for my son. Look at how he refers to him. My son. Whoop. where'd it go? Who became my son while I was in chains. Apparently I'm supposed to be done. He says, formerly, Onesimus was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him who is my very heart. Oh, my gosh. I'm old. I'm a prisoner. I'm sending you this guy who is my son. He is my very heart. Back to you. Understand, Onesimus or or Philemon has the right to hand this guy over and he'll be killed. And look at what is at stake for Philemon. It's not just his prejudices and it's not just his assumptions. This is not the only servant in the house. What happens if this guy gets away with this kind of behavior? What does it do to the whole system? 
I'm just telling you, the grace of God will mess with your assumptions and it will mess with your prejudices and it will reorganize your life. And here is Paul bringing this thing back to Philemon. He said, I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. Ooh, here I am, poor old Paul, locked away in prison for the sake of the gospel. And Philemon, you've never come to help me. But your former slave now, brother Onesimus, has been here, and I'd like to keep him so that he could do what you should be doing. <laughs> Tell me that's not thick. Wow. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that any favor that you would do will be spontaneous and not forced. (laughs) Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was so that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a brother. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or he owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not not to mention you owe me your very soul. I mean, that's the last one. You know, you'd be going to hell if it weren't for me, by the way, buddy. I mean. <laughs> Here is Paul, the guy that said we have to be able to speak the truth in love, dealing with an incredibly difficult circumstance and situation. Not able to do it in person, so he does it in letter, but it stands forever as an example to us of the fact that you can get around to the difficult issues And you can lay things in front of people and say, this is going to be a tough choice, and it is going to rearrange your lifestyle. It is is absolutely going to confront your assumptions and your prejudices about life. But here's where Jesus would have us go. You can do that, because that's what Paul does here. See, love never modifies the facts. Love changes the motive for addressing those facts, and it changes the demeanor of the person who is addressing them. I don't know why it was a few weeks ago I was watching on TV this movie, The Borrowers. Have you ever seen the movie, The Borrowers? It's just some complete fancy fairy tale kind of story. The borrowers are these little tiny people, and they like, they like live under the floorboards, and they borrow things from the big people, and that's, that's how they live, is by borrowing things from the, th- from the big people. And, and one of the borrowers is this really stubborn guy, and he's always making these really stupid decisions. And he's getting himself in trouble, and he gets his family in his trouble, and his daughter doesn't like him because of how he treated her and her friends. And I mean, it's just this constant thing. And he, 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 he really messes up big time. And he and his wife get caught by the big people, and they're in one of the mason jars, you know, in the, in the laboratory. And so they're looking out through the mason jar in the laboratory, and he says, I'm an idiot. And this is what his wife says, the truth spoken in love. Yes, you are. (laughs) But you're my idiot, so I forgive you. There it is. I thought... Oh, wow, that's exactly what I'm working on. That's it. I'm an idiot. Yeah, the facts would bear that up. <laughs> Us being stuck in this mason jar on this, <laughs> on this table, yeah, the facts would back that up. But you're my idiot, so I forgive you. If we don't figure out how to speak the truth in love, we're never going to grow up. We're never going to grow up. It'll never be safe. The world will never see what it needs to see when it looks at how we treat each other. We just have to do that. So it gets us to our next step. So right there in your bulletin next to all of those other things that you had was this blue card that talks about your next step. Our next steps always start with the the opportunity to commit your life to Christ. 
And I would certainly encourage you to do that. All this stuff we're talking about, about being mature and about growing up and all the rest of that is after that initial decision that says I'm actually going to become a follower of Jesus Christ. But in terms of what we listen to today, and we're going to collect these in just a moment. We're going to bring them up here and we're going to pray and just present our lives to God. It says, I need to practice speaking the truth in love. For some of you, that means probably the first thing you're going to have to learn how to do is to not say anything at all until you can learn to do it in love. So speaking the truth in love for some of you is actually going to be saying less than you've been saying. But for some of you who, because of love, were terrified at confronting the issues, some of you need to speak up. It's not the same response. It's the same goal. And it just depends on your character and how you're wired. For me, most of the time it means before I confront something, i got to process it for enough days that I get all the energy worked out so I can say what I need to say, and I can say it in love instead of in energy. Because most of the time, energy comes across negative. Just thought I'd tell you that. I need to develop the ability to hear the truth, because that's certainly the other side of it, is that if we're going to learn how to speak the truth, we have to learn how to hear the truth. And not every bad thing that somebody says is prejudice. Sometimes it's true. And I need to hear it and go, okay, I don't like that, but it's probably right. I need to deal with that. So take your blue card, mark down what your response is today to what we said. Find your offerings. We're going to collect them together. So the ushers are going to come and serve us and give us a chance to do that. Thank you again for being faithful in your giving and in your offerings. Like I say, say most every week, I can't pay you back, but I can say thank you. God will pay you back. So thank you for your faithfulness on that. While you're doing that, let me remind you that last week when we talked about the whole issue of abortion and how we think in America and then what we should do, and hopefully that's at least an example of an attempt to do the very thing we were talking about because it was a difficult issue, and hopefully we said, here's what's true about that. Here's why it's hard in America to hear that truth. But now that we've heard that, here's what we need to do. Not what they need to do, but what we need to do so that we can be redemptive in regards to that truth. So you'll have to decide whether or not we did it very well, but at least it was an attempt to try to do that on a very difficult topic. But in conjunction with that, we talked about that some of the people that are on the front line of of taking care of the, the, the emotional and physical problems that are connected with the whole issue of abortion versus birth and adoption or self-care, however all that works, are the people that work at the Pregnancy Care Center. Um, and we have, we have absolutely, without a doubt, one of the finest pregnancy care centers in America right here in Grants Pass. I, I would say that for a number of reasons. They have a brand new, beautiful facility, for one. They are one of only, Robin, help me, three or four, four clinics in America, pregnancy care centers, that are going to actually be licensed and as, as a full medical clinic. So what they do, they do with excellence, and they meet all the criterias of a full medical clinic. So they have all of that there. So it's not just people who care passionately about the topic but don't know what they're talking about. It's actually people who know what they're talking about. Um, so I would say because of their facility, because of the quality of the work that they do on a, at a medical level, uh, as I said, only one of four centers in all of America that are fully certified as a, as a full medical clinic. And then the other part of it is I'm just incredibly prejudiced because I think Robin and LaVon do an amazing job. So, um. <laughs> so we handed out baby bottles last week, and some of you have brought them back. I'm reminding you, bring them back. It does not do any good for you to take a bottle home, fill it full of coins, and leave it in your you know, counter or on your, your shelf or whatever. <laughs> it only helps if you bring it back. Okay, so you got to fill it out and, and fill it up and bring it back. Uh, and as Robin said, $100 bills and big checks fit nicely in here along with all the quarters. So uh, fill those out and bring them back. Uh, ushers, would you, uh, would you bring, bring up our, our blue cards and we're going to pray and say, God, help us do this. Because it sounds so easy, doesn't it? So, oh, just go speak the truth in love. Yeah, until you try it. And you're going, man, that's hard. <laughs> that's really hard, you know. Especially when you give it your best and it doesn't go over well. You know, it's like, oh, that didn't work, you know. 
So I, I usually invite the staff and elders and spouses, any, any of those that want to come. We can't all gather around the table here, but if you'd like to join me, just, again, you know, I, I realize some of what we're doing here is very symbolic, and sometimes symbolic things are nothing more than that. They're just kind of symbolic, but sometimes they're symbolic. Sometimes they mean something, and so hopefully what we have here are decisions and choices that people are making, some real commitments to try to do some things in some different ways. So, Father, we just put our lives before you and say, God, we don't want to avoid the one hard thing that you said was the thing that would help us grow up, and that is learning how to speak the truth in love. And so, Father, for some of us that that have no problem telling the truth, well, we love it. (laughs) We love to tell the truth. I pray that you would help us to learn to back up and back off and figure out how to say what we're saying in a way that is beneficial to the people that hear it, not just beneficial to us. And, Father, for some of us that that, that are just just uncomfortable with anything that has to do with confrontation, even if it's true. I pray, Father, that you would help some of us to find the courage to say, you know what? This really does need to stop. It's not just unfortunate. It's sinful. It needs to stop. And so let's bring it up. I I pray, Father, that whatever side of this spectrum we come from, that every one of us in this room would learn the art of speaking the truth in love, and that we would be mature enough that when someone else practices it on us, we wouldn't just say, well, they're prejudiced, but that we would actually listen to the truth. Help us to grow up, God. We want to grow up. We really want to grow up. Help us to do that, I pray in your name. Amen. 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 God bless you. We'll see you next week.